and systems are all lugging our operability. <laughs> or lack thereof. Another thing to consider too is we look at the solutions that were presented and what we think is the most actionable is looking at um, what technologies might be coming, like 3D printing. How does that affect the cost of those chips? How does that affect some of the uh, solutions that this is game changer? Do we think it's a game changer? Oh, it's you mind? Yeah. yeah. Nobody else on the video can hear you. Okay. There we go. I'm just taking notes. Check, check, check one, two. I have a pocket, yeah. Um, so what I was saying is, when we look at all these and we look at the solutions that were very, very hastily assembled, we wanted to give a little bit of time to talk about the validity of those uh, you know, action points and what could tactically be done today. And one of the things that came out in ours was really the need here is to have the semiconductor industry become the catalyst, right? for bringing these uh, different uh, EDA vendors to come together to create you know, a solution and that resolves a problem of, of the systems not talking together, especially when you've got one uh, design solution using you know, VHDL and another one using something else, so System Verilog. So um, I'm not technical enough to discuss the detail of that, but I think what would be really helpful here is for people to share their insights on what's the most actionable thing that you heard, what has the most promise today, and, uh, and kind of go free format in a discussion in that direction. Yeah. Somebody's <laughs> walking around with a... <laughs> uh, when I looked at these, uh, uh, two that kind of stood out, uh, Trevor's uh, gaps in System C for observation and debugging, one thing that he said when he was up there was that it's not that there isn't a solution, but there's 12 solutions out there. And so it seems like that's an actionable to, to form a committee of, of asking companies, would you donate a, as a starting point for, for something like that? I, that one seems very actionable along those lines. The second one that seemed actionable, uh, having been on the System Verilog committees, is the VHL and System Verilog incompatibility. We have had some efforts in the past of, of committees that tried to address that because, again, the vendor, multiple vendors have multiple solutions to it. And again, if there were a donation, I'll tell you probably the hard part on both of them, uh, because I know it was the hard part for us on the VHL system Verilog, was getting people to actually come and continue to come and participate. It wasn't that it was not doable. 
The same is true with your system. See, it's, it's not that it's not doable. It's finding the, the commitment from the multiple companies to, to go in there and actually do it. What creates that incentive for, to participate? How do you raise the game there? Send them to Hawaii? Well, you, you see, I, I wasn't very motivated. <laughs> for collaboration. That's the boondoggle sure. We'll get you off the Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wasn't very interested in the second one because, again, I was just trying to kill VHDL. But I mean, but yeah. <laughs> no, but no. But I mean, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, I'd be curious to know what Dennis and Stan think about how you get people to participate because you've got tools in this area. Well, I've I've tried twice and it didn't end up in anything that was sustain, sustaining. I would I would say this. Uh, it's, it's recognized as a problem here amongst all of us. It's documented up on the board. But if I were to bring that back to my group at my company and say this is a problem that has been identified, most likely they, they would say, no, that was solved uh, two decades ago. And so what incentive exists for us to go and attempt to solve a problem that we actually think is solved? So who? And it might, they may not trust you, Cliff, to say there's a problem there, but it's almost the, there has to be uh, an economic partner in this that makes it uh, a, a problem for many of us. So I don't know what Stan has to say. <laughs> good, good fake. Um, I, I think that is just... Um, heaven forbid, actually, he may have said something correct. It's, um, <laughs> it's. My lips moved. I didn't lie. <laughs> had to happen sooner or later. Anyway, uh, I do think economics incentive is exactly the the point of view. I forget who it was was saying that it has to have the user companies come and say this is an issue, and you know, this is this is what you get if you solve it, and this is what you don't get, or this is what you will get if you don't solve it. Uh, both ways, you know, positive yeah. and negative. And I do, th I do on a technical standpoint, I haven't been one of the first guys in VHDL and somewhere around in Verilog, I don't think you're going to be able to get complete interoperability from a technical standpoint. You might be able to get a subset. Now, you know, getting the right subset together and get interoperability, you can, but we tried that several times. That, that's not an argument, but if, if indeed the right companies were to come together and come to a cadence synopsis and mentor, I think we'd have to listen. So I mean, that's where the... That's where, quote, unquote, the solution would be, is to give us, some, give us speaking from Caden's standpoint, and um, give us some economic incentive to do it and some economic disincentive not to do it, which is usually the case. Because, I mean, frankly, from our standpoint, our, our simulators will handle both languages just fine. Mm -hmm. And why should, you know, why should we help out Questa? By yeah. making work with them, and that's not that might sound crass and all that, but that's that's how our paychecks are paid. It's a reality. So I'll take that opportunity as a uh, as an opportunity to uh, put a plug in for something that Karen said earlier, which is that part of the reason why the systems and semiconductor and IP companies need to be involved in these standards activities is precisely to shine a light on the problems that they think are important and need standardization, but which aren't getting attention by the EDA vendors that are involved in the process. And I have to say, uh, we just, I heard from Voin this morning and I heard from uh, Shushma on, on the low power standards. One thing Voin says was that there's you know, a new low power stand, new low power group, and in fact, there's another low power group in the system level that a fellow named Nagu from IBM is going to be running. And um, one of the solu solutions, one of the things that we came up with to avoid the issue where working groups were working across purposes was a so-called coordinating committee. Now that hasn't, that's only, you know, a theory right now because the groups haven't really started. But the notion is, is that the chairs of each of the group, independent mm -hmm. people who are interested and so forth will meet together at least once a quarter, if not once a month, in order to make sure that we're looking at different things, di different, um, not, not solve, trying to solve the same problem two or three different ways. One of the things that could be done if enough user companies push it is for a, co a committee that would actually look at VHDL Verilog, system Verilog interoperability under the IEEE. There's no reason why that couldn't happen. It's just 
I'm, as a cadence person, I'm not going to go and tell my bosses, hey, we have going to go to this new activity that we're going to try to come, we're going to become compatible with VCS and Questa. That's career limiting. On the other hand, if Intel, you know, I guess some Intel people here comes over and said, well, if you don't do that, then you might want to listen. So, I mean, there is a forum for doing this, a forum for coordinating between different activities. I do have to say, after we started VHDL in 1986, I didn't think that, 18, I'm calculating here, 28 years later, okay, we'd still be thinking about the issues. Well, what did I do for 28 years? I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. I'm still here. Well, that kind of echoes what we were saying before about how do we get the semiconductor industry to take leadership in bridging languages and, 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 and sort of pushing companies together to maybe work a little bit more in, our, in, in a more interoperable fashion. Believe it or not, he has a comment. <laughs> Woohoo. Well, uh, I, actually, what, what I just heard from Dennis and Stan, and, and it's, it rings true to me, is that uh, this isn't the EDA companies to do it. This is gonna, going to be big customer companies that are going to right. tell the EDA vendors, you will do this if you want to be on our purchase list in the future. I use the term be the heavy, but I, I believe Dennis more appropriately used the term be the catalyst. I'm going to get Shishma for I, I, okay. I, I give it to her in a minute. But I would say it's not just... The, the, the companies, they, um, the, the, the user companies that have to force this to happen, they have to decide what level of interoperability really is necessary. You're not going to get full interoperability of the languages. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. Um, as a representative from the user company, what I have to share is that uh, the first question the company asked is, what's the business need to, for an IEEE participation? How is it going to affect our company's bottom line? And can you tell me more information about our competitors in the, in the standardization committee? Are you going to share information? Yeah. So in fact, it is, the, the IEEE participation is purely voluntary. There is zero incentive from the company to participate because they don't see, they sometimes see this as a, as a conflict of interest because they, they, you could potentially reveal things accidentally without mm -hmm. your knowledge. Uh, that could uh, jeopardize the company's uh, secrets, even though we do talk about not infringing upon patents and IP and technology, but there's always that. And so, I, at least in my past company, people viewed it as a way to further an individual's career and not some sort of social work to, uh, you know, um, kind of evangelize low power in the industry. So it's not viewed as some sort of an evangelization mission. It's seen as a person trying to just get visibility for an individual's benefit. And therefore, there's no incentive for the company or a user company to actually you know, put people and pay them to be on committees. So I guess it's important to change the perception that companies have. Also have to point out that some companies won't give you employment if you were uh, very particular about participating on IEEE committees. I comment right back there. So uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that uh, companies don't uh, encourage their part their their employees to participate in in standard building bodies. Uh, on behalf of Intel, I can safely say that we have uh, our employees in, engaged in at least uh, you know 10 or 15 uh, committees just within Accelera and and many more within SI2 mm -hmm. for the for this strict purpose of actually building standards. So uh, I think the, the, as, as Stan pointed out, it is incumbent upon the semiconductor users to come together and force the issue about the standards mm -hmm. that they want to see. And we do see this happening uh, um, by way of system verilog when it was first brought into the picture, and UVM and so on and so forth, that the, the users companies did get together and formulate the standards. So it happens, unfortunately, the pace at which standards come about is just agonizingly slow. And that's just the nature of things. I, I would say that um, taking Shushma's point, I, I think she, you know there's you know two two opposite things can be true at the same time. And I would I understand you've had the experience uh, where it's considered to participation in this kind of group is considered good for an individual career. But I also think that if you can show if the company recognizes the economic benefit that is to say the business benefit, then people will, like companies like Intel and so forth, will, will not only allow participation, will sometimes force participation. I know people. Do you know if the, the software makers is a part of the 
Triple E committee? And my answer was no, they are not a part of the committee. And that was kind of set the tone for how uh, the company thought about IEEE participation. So who, are they? Who, who was that company? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it changes all the time. But I believe that Cisco, for example, took part in the Ethernet committees. As the, in fact, at one point there was an issue about uh, all the router companies were participating, and and there was draft standards that people implemented, and the drafts uh, got changed, and so forth. Which indicates to me that the router companies were all participating because they saw a need to be right up there. So I think it's it's a matter of how the standard, how the standards are presented as being key to your business. <laughs> You need two mics. Uh, I'm so sorry. Um, there were there were two standards. Broadcom was big on Wi-Fi, and you know, 802.11. There was massive interest on that. But 1801 was not considered to be, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, as interesting as that. And also, when it comes to low power, people were asking, okay, what are the top um, cell phone companies? You know, number one, cell phone maker. Number two, cell phone maker. Oh, they are not a part of the committee. Then. We are trying to make chips for those guys. Then are they in the committee? Then what's the incentive to join? Maybe they're not joining for a reason. Maybe, we, maybe because every, they've gotten everything they wanted. <laughs> and also, there's a perception that you can get things done through EDA vendors. Yeah, okay. Okay. Mm. But, but, but I think what we hit was, again, I don't know how long we're supposed to be going here, but right. th this is not a debate between Shishma and I, so. Yeah. <laughs> but, the bottom line is, I think on the Broadcom situation, you said that they were interested when it was clearly key for a bottom line product. I mean, the, the, it was just 802.11, I mean, it's just there. On the on low power, that it's become more of a diffuse issue, right? Because yeah, low power is interesting, but it doesn't, there's not a low power product. So I can imagine why that's not, a, it's just I can imagine why that was the case. So I, I have a little bit of the uh, history of some of it where it, it first materialized and that we did, we were all, EDA was all solving it and we were all solving it differently. We were actually reading words that, 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 uh, that companies wanted. And I would also say that the mobile, uh, the mobile providers e evolve over time. And so, uh, you know, the TI, OMAP team and Nokia were struggling with uh, providers that were uh, offering a low power solution, albeit a bit differently, and they're struggling having to invest in translators in teams that, that would uh, take the, the, um, uh, the, the dogma of one set of semantics and translate it into the other. And you might do that for one or two tools, but after a while that became a, a, a burden because now you're not, you're, your value add was not on in doing the design of the Wi-Fi or the other uh, telephony uh, elements in there. What your expertise was was in translating between one format and another, or from one tool's uh, you know uh, uh, embodiment of a of low power scheme uh, uh, to another, and it was not translatable even outside of their environment. So, for example, if you want to switch suppliers or even work with other companies that might uh, uh, think the same way you do, now you took on the responsibility of indoctrinating them or educating. And once a standard is in place, that becomes a little bit easier, uh, easier to do. So I know we were, we were pushed together. The, there was an economic incentive applied to us to come together to try to work on all of this stuff that has resulted in, in 1801. So in the beginning, uh, I think we, we thought we were all solving this on our own and we thought we were all okay doing what we were doing, uh, but a set of companies came together and said, no, you're not. And what we'd like to see is everybody work together. Uh, it wasn't everyone in the industry and, and there have been a lot of competing technologies out there continue to compete and, and have, uh, have value. I would also make the point that I think that both user companies like a Broadcom and a, um, a companies like, um, um, like like a Cadence Mentor or Synopsy EDA companies both work for when they, they, they'll join standard, well, EDA companies will join because every EDA standard is part of their core business. Whereas um, the user companies tend to join when they see there's an issue and then they tend to go away. A little known fact, being an old guy, I remember most of this stuff, the early days of System C, 
Ericsson was a member. Fujitsu was making handsets was a member. Uh, the part of Sony that was making handsets were a member. Uh, Nokia was a member. Qualcomm was a member. And why? Because they saw System C as the future for designing handsets. Mm -hmm. Then when System C 2000, you know, 2005 came out, solved problem. We don't need to hang around anymore for putting icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of just trying to tie this all back together. If the companies that are using that are using EDA tools, semiconductor IP companies, as, as Shishpal calls them, whatever you want to call them, it could be systems companies too. If 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 indeed they see economic r reasons to try to pull at least a subset of VHDL and Verilog together, then this is their time to make it happen. Now maybe once that happens, they disappear again, but that's okay. If you solve a problem and then disappear, that's as good as solving a problem. Oops. No, no, no. I, I was, I was wondering if there's something we could actually do to help everybody out. Stan, you said it's easy when, when one or two of us come together, the third shows up, and the like. And if it's called an EDA standard, we have, we have an incentive to just because it's our business. So uh, if there, if, if uh, some companies feel that it's a, a individual's uh, selfish activity of self-promotion in trying to elevate their presence in the industry by participating in a standard, maybe much as you might be saying as a case uh, that, that you've observed, uh, Sushma, maybe there needs to be on the flip side of that a white paper of some sort when we actually do uh, either institute a standards program or want to want to go down that route to talk about what the economic value and return is yeah. for participating in something, and we don't do that. We leave that to everyone's imagination, maybe, and maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe there ought to, there ought to be uh, some some clear things that talk about what some expected benefits of having a standard or participating in the development uh, of the standard will yield. And that you would be able to share, others would be able to share with, uh, with the business managers that you have to interact with so that they could participate in making a decision with you uh, to participate in one form or another in the standards project. It can be an assumption, uh, you know, we mentioned the telecommunications industry, there can be an assumption that you're just gonna do the right thing and. I don't really need to be involved in the design of the chip when I just need to know what the chip can do. But when you, when you go back and say, you know, what we, what we need to know is what you want to do. Help us, help us design that for you. You know, there's a, there's a different kind of way of speaking to them that might provide instant incentive. Even a white paper in business cases, huge, you know, it's a huge way to help people understand what the business benefit is to them. But even on a one-to-one, -one, maybe they don't always know that they should be there and, and how impactful it could be. And I guarantee you get one there, you might get a few others. So let me talk about uh, someone who got involved in this because uh, he was chided for not participating in it. I had a tool that was implementing IEEE standards and I did not need to participate in, in the creation of it. You put it down on paper, I, we've got a lot of competent engineers that can read the paper and we'll just implement uh, the standard. So what it, how, whatever uh, joyous parties you had in Hawaii, or whatever contentious <laughs> debates you had in Olu, Finland in the middle of winter, uh, got you to a reason standard, we didn't care. It just what was, what was the outcome of it, and then we would support it. But I was chided that I was not, and my company weren't providing enough input, whether it was financial cash input, uh, incentive, uh, uh, and other, other things to help encourage things along that we decided to take some, to, some stands to actually do more of this work. And I often think it's probably something people wish never would have happened. Uh, we, were, we were doing just fine, believe me, Cliff, we love VHDL. And if it had only been VHDL, we had been very happy. But we got in the middle of this, and for some reason, we got sucked into the Verilog vortex, and obviously we became a big lover of, of uh, system Verilog in that process. But if we hadn't been there, I don't think we would have implemented as early and soon. And so my industry uh, uh, competitors uh, felt that they were doing the heavy lifting, and I had, a, I had an obligation 
to carry the same weight. It was, I had an unfair advantage not to have to pay the hotel and, and airfares that the rest of them had to pay in order to get to a uh, working product. I don't know how much time we have. Like, but I like well, we that. have an extra time block for a third group to go. So we probably, uh, we could probably break here any time. But there's one more question back there. Oh, just about. Okay. Uh, I think Dennis brought up a very good point that uh, even though there might be you know, so many active participants, uh, there are probably many other who are, who are willing to follow but uh, feel that they can live with either A or B or C or D, whichever it, one, whichever it may be, and they're happy to go along with that. So I think <coughs> in that sense, we probably do find uh, many of our uh, semiconductor, co semiconductor companies who are basically in, this, in a very similar boat. And so we shouldn't take their lack of participation as lack of unwilling to accept a standard. So I think those are two different things, and we should uh, be if, uh, willing to move forward even with a smaller number of participants. So that shouldn't be an issue. That's, that's good. Good insight. I, I would just bring up for everyone's case, in case you think this is all pie in the sky and can the user semiconductor users actually influence things, I have three letters for you, UVM. Okay, Dennis and I were on one side of an industry fight with a language called, a methodology called OVM. Synopsis was, you know, pushing a methodology called VMM, and that's fine. And we, you know, we're moving along, and it was two separate methodologies. And um, 2008, I was asked to go to dinner from a lunch with a guy from Freescale who I never met before, and he said, I want OVM to be a standard. Oh, geez, you know, I just started, and I, said, I don't want that. He says, yeah, 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 it's going to happen, okay. Then three days later, I got a call from a director at Intel, and it wasn't Shishpao, saying, we want OVM to be a standard. And my life sort of passed before my eyes, and I said, <laughs> okay, when do you want a standard? <laughs> and that's how OVM became UVM to a large degree, and Tom Alsop and from Intel and Hillel Miller from Freescale became, became shares of the group. And frankly, it was a user companies. And then, you know, it, Synopsis got involved and you know, the registers were designed on the basis of what VMM had and so forth. So it became a real industry kind of a standard. But that was something that EDA companies left on their own would have just been meandering, meandering along with two different incompatible methodolo universal Probably methodologies. Happy. We would have been still happy. And, and, but, but on the other hand, you know, the, the, the user companies went and said, thou shalt work together. And we said, yes, sir, how high do we have to jump? So it can work. All right. Well, thank you. I hope you found that uh, interesting and, and, and uh, good, good feedback. So as the symposium continues and as your industry works toward reaching some of these solutions. So uh, we'll be capturing all of this as part of our uh, outcome of the, uh, of the event. But also, you know, we'll have this uh, displayed when it's uh, I guess we'll consolidate a lot of this information during the reception. But I guess I'm looking at uh, Dennis. I think we're on a break. Uh